Okay, Chair, when you're ready, we are now live on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to East Devon District Council's Cabinet meeting for the 6th of October 2021. I'll be chairing the meeting, Councillor Paul Arnott. Welcome to anyone watching via live stream. Following an extraordinary general meeting of Council on the 26th of July 2021, I'd like to remind members and any members of the public that the Council has delegated much of the decision making to senior officers for a short period of time until the 17th of January 2022 due to concerns around COVID. Consequently, this will be a consultative meeting only. We will adhere as much as possible to the procedural rules detailed in the constitution. However, where the meeting would have normally decided a matter, it will now make a recommendation to the senior officer. The officer will then take that recommendation into account when making their decision. May I please remind members that the code of conduct applies throughout. Uh, please uh, remember to disconnect uh, any uh, telephones or have them on silent or off or whatever. Uh, in the event of a break in the internet, we'll try and reconnect within 15 minutes. And if we can't, we'll have to adjourn and reconvene at a later date. Um, if you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. And you can view the agenda, members of public, at the website, eastend.gov.uk. We'll now start with Debbie, our Democratic Services Officer tonight, doing a roll call of committee members here present. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with you, please, Chair. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayward, I have apologies from, so we'll come to that later. Councillor Armstrong, please. Present. Thank you. Councillor Hookway. Present. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Don't see Councillor Jackson. Councillor Young. Present. Thank you. Councillor Ledger. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you, Debbie. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Loudon. Present. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Councillor Rickson, please. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Rowland, please. Present. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you, Chair. I can confirm that you're correct. Thank you very much indeed, Debbie. Uh, and uh, Cabinet members, just to say, in the unlikely and highly undesirable uh, uh, event that I crash off air for some reason, which is known, uh, in the absence of Councillor Haywood, the deputy tonight, on the basis of his youth and technical skill, Councillor Den Dan Ledger will step up in those circumstances. I, I, I could have trusted any one of you, I know, but you know. Um, agenda item one is public speaking, and there are no members of the public registered to speak at this point. There is a statement to be read out prior to item 14 on behalf of a member of the public from Cranbrook. Gender item two is the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, if anyone has a comment on the set of minutes from the 1st and the 8th of September 2021, please do so by raising your blue, your electronic hand. But if I see no hands raised, I'll take this as an indication that you will agree the minutes of the previous meeting. I look for hands. I don't like calling them electronic hands. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Uh, there we go. That's good. Thank you. The minutes of the previous meeting are recommended to be agreed. Agenda item three, uh, apologies, Debbie. So I have apologies from Councillor Hayward, Chair, as you mentioned earlier. Thank you very much. Um, we now go to declarations of interest. Again, back to a roll call through Debbie. Thank you, Chair. Can I start with you, please? Yes, I would like to declare a personal interest on <laughs> agenda item uh, 18, I think it is. Yes, the Collerton Neighbourhood Plan Examiner's Report. I am a, an elected councillor at Collerton Parish Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll move on to Councillor Armstrong, please, for declarations. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, no, no, thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Hookway, please. Uh, yes, uh, personal interest item 10. Um, uh, the Queen's Drive Delivery Group. I am the uh, a board member for Littlem. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Young, any declarations, please? Uh, no, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Councillor Ledger, next, please. None, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Councillor Loudon, please. None, Debbie, thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Rickson, please. None, thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Rowland, please. And none from me. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, we now move on to agenda item five, which is late items or matters of urgency. There are none this evening. Agenda item six is confidential or exempt items. Uh, there are none which officers recommend should be dealt with in this way. And then we go on to agenda item seven. Uh, Campbell members, are you happy that we recommend that for approval? Um, if anybody would like to speak, dissent, contribute in any way, please raise a hand. Uh, I see no hands there, apart from my enormous one on the screen, uh, in which case those are recommended for approval. Thank you. Agenda item eight, we now go on to the minutes section. And the first is the minutes of the scrutiny committee held on the 29th of July, 2021. Uh, there is one minute that has a recommendation to cabinet uh, on agenda page 14, uh, which is minute seven, uh, the report on proposed actions to improve staff morale. Um, can I ask if anybody from outside of Cabinet would like to speak on that? Nobody there. Okay, can I come back within Cabinet then, please, for any comments on that minute 17? Yes, Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, apologies uh, for being slightly late. Um, I'm guessing there are declarations of interest of which I have none. Uh, so I thought we should do that bit. Um, yes, um, there's two recommendations in this uh, report. Uh, one is around member champions um, and the other one is around member training. Um, firstly, with regards to member champions, um, these are appointed at annual council according to our constitution um, and the expectation is that the member champions that are appointed serve two years so we're probably due for a review of those anyway in advance of annual council um, but uh, taking on board the points raised by the CEO um, about how um, these could be perhaps reinstated in some areas. And it's, it's worth also uh, pointing out in these minutes, it, it gives the indication that these were removed. They're not, we have four member champions at present um, and these could be expanded. Um, but I think probably the framework that the member champions fall within may need uh, a, a little more thought um, in order to ensure that there's um, a benefit um, and value delivered, not just to uh, the membership, but also to the officers. So um, I would like to suggest that perhaps the thing for us to do with regards to member champions um, is to ask if the CEO or uh, perhaps the monitoring officer might be able to come back to us with suggestions and a report about how other councils um, perhaps use the member champions, um, as well as how these could help to assist uh, officers within their roles for the, the flow of information, which is, I think, probably um, the, the key element highlighted in the, the report to scrutiny. Um, so that would be my suggestion around that one, if everyone's um, happy with doing that, and if Mark's happy to do so, or Henry, in fact. Um, Around member development, um, I'm in discussions with Democratic Services at the moment about rebooting member development. Um, it hasn't met for a long time. Um, and uh, so my, uh, my plan is for there to be a member development working party convened, uh, hopefully in November, um, with the initial um, purpose to review the minutes for the pre from the previous member development identify the issues raised in those, and also look to uh, pull together a, a member survey just to capture data around uh, where people feel they've got knowledge gaps, where they think training works, doesn't work, um, and any other issues that have been raised um, in the previous minutes and since, because I'm, I'm very aware that we've been working within 
a virtual environment for quite a while now. And that may very well continue for a little while longer, which changes how we deal with training. Um, but after we've had that meeting, I would hope to have a second one that follows on from that. Um, once we've got that data, um, and I'm very aware that there are other issues around staff, uh, sorry, around member training uh, that have come out of this report and other reports. Um, so I would be looking to then start working through those in the follow up meeting. Um, so I'd welcome any report um, to member development on specific areas of training that are required with the anticipation of trying to put together a, a more um, comprehensive ongoing training program. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Jackson. So if I'm if I'm reading this right, um, uh, the recommendation B, um, that functions OK as it is at the moment, doesn't it? Because effectively it's asking for this to move on as soon as possible. And thank you very much for that comprehensive report. And it is. And what we'd be asking uh, under a recommendation that um, flows from A here is that we just ask for a report on member champions, because as you say, they have been in abeyance for, in part. And yet, you know, today we've had another fantastic um, piece of correspondence from a mental health champion, Tony Woodward, Councillor Tony Woodward. So I think we need some clarity on that. Um, Henry, can I just ask you, how, how do we express that in the form of words? <laughs> that yeah. Would work? I mean, I speak on behalf of Mark, but I assume it would be me looking oh, or at... Oh, Mark, so I didn't see him there. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. I just... Well, well, could, could oh, I just... Sorry, Mark, I didn't yeah, see your hand. Please, after okay. you, please, Mark, yeah. Thank you. So it, it was, just to put a clarity, because essentially this, this element came up through the planning staff in their survey response, and I think they felt that the lack of member champion roles in the various areas that planning covers meant that there wasn't sort of that member uh, expertise and also member capacity whereby other councillors could be referred to the uh, member champions for sort of clarification, explanation and other other issues where in a way, if you like, the member champions helped, helped the staff because there was additional capacity to deal with uh, councillor queries because the member champions could could help with those particular aspects. So whether it was conservation areas, listed buildings, uh, neighbourhood planning areas, all that type of thing, for example. So uh, I think that's the thrust of where the, the planning staff were saying that this could actually help them. So if you want a report, fine, by all means. But that's the that's the essence, I think, of what the staff were trying to get Cabinet to um, to consider and agree on. Thank you, Mark. That, that's really helpful. And if if we, uh, uh, yeah, not to not to ask for an extensive report, but I think essentially something along the lines of, of what you just explained, that would be very helpful if you can. And then we can bring that back in November, can't we? And, and, and uh, uh, discuss that and hopefully vote that through then. Um, I'm happy to come back out of Cabinet to Councillor Alan Dent, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm currently the uh, champion for the Armed Forces Covenant. And we've been having, I've been having regular meetings every two, three months with John Golding, Megan Armstrong, uh, just to keep a watching brief, really, because that's, that's what it boils down to, of what the council is doing. And the essence of the, of the covenant is that no veteran should be disadvantaged. And I can, I, was, I had a report all set for the <clears throat> annual meeting, which was, never came, came out, but basically, I can assure the council and cabinet that as far as I can tell, and I'm sure John Golding will back me up, that there is no disadvantage to anyone, but we are watching it and updating our policies as we go along. That's one thing. Same thing is, as far as member development is concerned, believe it or not, I was a portfolio holder prior to the previous election and with the Democratic Services produced that training program that was that uh, all new members and existing members were invited to follow. The issue here is that members need to participate. And one of the problems we've had in the past is that they don't. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to join in those training programs, particularly new members, but well, not particularly all of us, because they are extremely valuable. Um, and I was also, believe it or not, a member champion 
uh, on the planning side for building historics, historic buildings and so on. And that is useful because I used to go to um, conferences with the RTPI, the Planning Institute, and that was, for me, very educational and I could report back and, and, it, and, and influence, maybe, the decisions that were being made at, at the, in the planning committees. So I fully support member champions. They have a specific role to play. Sometimes, like the Armed Forces champion, they're a bit vague, but we can make something of them and come back to cabinet and come back to council with reports. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Alan. Can, can I ask you a question, if I may? It's really interesting yeah. to see, see how we can sort of help on this. So just looking, let's say you, you were still, you had an expertise in, you know, sort of listed buildings or whatever, and we're, we're a member champion now. Um, I'm just thinking about what the workload for you might be if, you know, three or four members had issues at the same time. How, how I mean, from your experience, how... That, that interaction between you and the planning officers and then back to the member, how, how, how would that work or does it? Well, that, I would say that was very typical of, of what a ward member or a, a member of the planning committee who also being a ward member, when he answers queries from, from members of the ward or elsewhere. Mm. You listen to the question. If you know the answer, you give it. If I didn't know the answer, I go back to the planning team and this is I hate to say it, Chair, but this is where the, the face-to-face thing is so valuable because it mm-hmm. pop into the office and say, well, what do you think about it? Soon, and soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know my view on that. Yeah. Uh, so we could, we could jointly come up with a, with, a, with a response that met the policies uh, and m- maybe satisfied the query, maybe not, because that's often the way. So it was a, a, a face-to-face thing that, that I would do at the time and talk to people. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so, just looking for, oh, we've got a, quite a lineup here. I'll come outside one last time, if I may, to our, um, our erstwhile neighbourhood planning champion, Councillor Bruce Desaro. Actually, Chair, thank you. You you took the words right out, out of my mouth. I was I actually going to say that, I, that I, I, I fully supported what Councillor Dent had said, and, and I did interact quite well as a previous Neighbourhood Plan lead member. And in fact, I, we organised a conference uh, in 2018 or 2019, um, which a lot of towns and parishes came to. So I guess that was my very modest contribution to the way the council ran back then. Uh, and so I think Councillor Dent has had offered very sensible advice, uh, and, and as, as well as our CEOs, also offered very similar uh, positive advice and I think that if the council is so minded it could look at the role of member champions and I think I suggested it uh, at the poverty meeting the other day an inclusion champion to ensure that uh, rural broadband and things like that are our champions so I think there is a lot of things that members can do and I certainly think it's something to look forward to to look forward to doing thank you chair thank you I think I thought I'll come to Mr Gordon Ellis first before before councillor Jackson if I may uh, Henry Thank you. Forgive me if I if I if I tread on Councillor Jackson's toes. I, th- I think um, there's melding quite a few different things in in here because when member champions were reintroduced, or well, sorry, perhaps go a step back, there were a lot of member champions at one point. I mean, I, I, you know, almost half the membership were a member champion. I, I think at one point, which obviously then begs the question of the value added aspect, which is what Councillor Jackson has has picked up on. But when they were reintroduced on the smaller number. It was uh, a, um, a part of the, the part of the decision that there would be a review of member champions. So that's a piece of work that is required anyway, I think. Um, but also picking up on what the chief executive has said, uh, obviously there could be a report back in November specifically in relation to LPA related member champions um, with a further review to follow uh, um, in perhaps uh, you're giving a bit more time for that piece of work. So if you were looking for a specific recommendation or outcome from this you, know, you, you might wish to note scrutiny's uh, uh, recommendations and and uh, feel that no further recommendation is required on the back of uh, uh, um, expressed views that there would be a review of member champions um, both in the short term in relation to, to local planning authority and more long term um, in, in totality of the positions so something along those lines, if you were minded, so that there's no sort of further senior officer decision that's required on this, because I think there's a general willingness to, to do it. And also you can re- note that um, Councillor Jackson's committed to the Member, de- member Development Working Group going forward. Um, OK, and- thanks, Henry. Coming back to Councillor Jackson then. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, yeah, I mean, Henry's uh, summarised quite well on the, on the number of points and... Um, 
I think it's it's critical to understand that there are other issues around member champions that need to be taken into consideration, um, which uh, could um, equate to a situation where we were at before, where we had a lot of titles, but perhaps not all of those were serving the council or the officers um, in a particularly helpful way. Um, and uh, as uh, Councillor Dent has um, raised as well, um, there is a, an expectation at the moment that member champions provide a report to annual council, and I don't think that was included in the most recent annual council. Um, and, and I would encourage um, member champions that we do have um, to, to communicate with the wider membership through other means um, on a regular basis anyway, if they're able to, because I think that information that um, Councillor Dent shared with us today is something that we wouldn't necessarily have been aware of um, prior to this meeting. So it would be good to have sort of like an ongoing discussion with those member champions. Um, but I'm also on top of that aware that whilst um, they may very well facilitate um, uh, communications in one area of the council, they may also um, add additional burden to officers in other areas. So I think there's, it, it's a wider issue and it needs some careful consideration. Um, I certainly don't think it's as it needs to stay right now. There's room for improvement. So, um, yeah, I think a, a wider uh, review. So I, think, I think so. Probably then what the way we're flowing is that we, we can note B, but that on A, we we do want some further thought across the piece, inc including the planning, of course, as well. Um, so. Um, Yes, so that's so. I suppose that's it. We take B, we know B as it is, uh, and that on A, uh, we request a, a report. Um, on um, sorry, take B as it is, and on A, uh, re just request a report, a short report on member champion roles, um, and their future. I mean, I think that's it is what we need because clearly tonight there's there's all sorts of things, aren't there? There. Um, and I'm thinking as well that in terms of planning, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of how hard the, the, the chair of planning uh, works. Uh, and I know she is consulted by many members, um, you know, and asked, uh, asked things. So I think, I think she should be consulted on this as part of that process as well to feed in what her experience is. So, Cabinet, are we, are we happy with that as a way forward? Um, we we got lots of nods. Henry, I've lost the plot. Do we still need to take a vote on these things? We ought to, really, wouldn't we? Well, <laughs> yes, 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 just get general, general agreement across cabinet for the Okay. For the All right. So can I then um can I then no, well ask De Debbie, can you lead us through a vote on that one then, please? Yes, of course, Chair. So members of the cabinet, if you're in agreement, could you please use your green ticks? If you're against, please use your red cross or use your electronic hand if you're abstaining. And I have nine votes in favour, no against, no abstentions, Chair, that's carried, thank you. Thank you very much for all who contributed there. That was a very interesting discussion and I look forward to us um, moving forward on that positively on the basis of just a little bit more knowledge. Uh, agenda item nine is the minutes of the community grant panel, the 31st of August 2021. Uh, we don't have any matters arising from that. Uh, do members wish to make any particular recommendations on this item or can we agree to move this forward without specific recommendations? So looking for anybody who might want to contribute on that. Oh, there comes, look at that. Um, yep. OK, nobody from outside Cabinet, so I'll come to Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Sorry, I think my green tick was still showing. It wasn't oh. was a virtual hand to speak, actually, Leader. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I, okay. I kept putting the green tick down, it kept reappearing for some reason. No, I know this perhaps, is we've got... Perhaps Debbie was playing games with me, I don't know. Perhaps. No, I've, I've been doing <laughs> random thumbs up at inappropriate moments in meetings out of my control. So, yeah. As you okay. said, there's no, there's no recommendations that came out of that particular meeting. Okay, so we're happy to note those then. Um, so moving forward to agenda item 10, the minutes of the Queen's Drive Delivery Group held on the 7th of September 2021. 
and there is one minute that has a recommendation to cabinet on, um, so I've, I've skipped a page here, agenda page 22, uh, and that's minute number four, planning position update. Um, do members wish to make any particular recommendations on this item, or can we agree to move this forward without specific recommendation? I'm delighted to see the hand of Councillor Bruce de Sarum has come straight up. Bruce, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again, Chair. I just wanted to briefly mention to members that having read this report, I think there are two points that come to mind. The first, that it is crucial that any development and delivery work in Exmouth fits in with the local plan uh, process. And the second point is that the delivery group is now under-resourced in terms of officer support. Those, those are the two key messages that I got from that report. And in, re in re response to the minute, I would say that it's not necessarily getting the temporary use right. It's a question of making sure that we fit to the local plan so that actually something will happen for the people of Exmouth. And I'm not proposing tonight to discuss what will or will not happen, but I want to emphasize the importance of putting something to the local plan so that the delivery group does actually achieve its aim and deliver something for the, for the people of Exmouth. So thank you so much indeed, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Desarum. Um, Councillor Steve Gazard, please. Oh, good evening, Chair, and apologies for, for being late. Um, work to do. Um, I, I just heard um, Councillor Bruce de Sarum and I, I read the report myself. I would agree with his comments, but obviously the um, most important thing for me is, is that we get something done for the short term, which is next year. So that's just my comments on the report, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, the recommendation we have to Cabinet under Minute 4 says that in order to provide certainty moving forward, permanent planning consent for temporary uses on the Queen's Drive site be sought as soon as possible. And my understanding on this, I imagine Councillor Hookway may have something to say on it as well, is that is what it is. It's the recommendation to make sure that we're in a position to, to deliver uh, the same um, excellent activities that there were uh, this year as well. That, that's, uh, thank you very much, Councillor Gazard, on that. Um, I'll, I'll come... If Megan would excuse me, I'll come to Councillor Hookway next then, and then Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Hookway, please. Yes, uh, um, yes, really just to uh, follow on from various comments made. Uh, the position is the group was, was advised by Ed Freeman that um, planning consent will end um, in the spring and that planning permission must be, um, must be sought and gained. Um, and the group decided that it wanted to have plan uh, permanent uh, planning permission uh, for the temporary activities that are uh, likely to be uh, available for next year, which the events team uh, will, be, um, uh, will be booking. Uh, it's not intended to be a long-term uh, issue. It is simply a matter of maintaining uh, attractions on the seafront for the benefit of uh, residents, visitors and local businesses. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Hookway. Uh, Councillor Megan Armstrong, please. Oh, thanks, Chair, yeah. I've just looked on the list. I thought Ed was with us tonight because I wanted to ask him a question. But other members, and although I sit on the delivery group, I just wanted him to just remind us, remind me anyway, what the implications might be if, if this permanent, I'm not saying I'm against it, but I just want to know what the implications would be for the future if we get this permanent planning consent for temporary use. Now, I don't know whether Nick or yourself or somebody else might be able to answer that. But I just don't want us to go down a path that's going to limit us in future. I suppose that's what I'm saying. I think I don't think Ed is in tonight, but shout Ed if you are. And I'm happy to come back to Nick. My understanding is that the point is so that we don't have to keep applying every few years for the possibility mm. of having temporary. Th I know it's a, it's a paradox, isn't it? It's mm. sort of permanent and temporary, but I, I think that's what that means, so that we don't get into the position we're in now, having to yet again do it. That, that's, yeah. that's, can I ask Nick? I mean, if it helps, if it oh, was, sorry, yes, Mark, yes, please, thank you. If it helps, Chair. Um, yeah, so essentially, at the moment, you have a, a number of temporary um, buildings uh, on, the, um, on the site, and that includes the play area as well. A permanent permission would say that those things can continue, uh, but it wouldn't um, uh, necessarily compromise or, or, or stymie any other uh, mm. things that either the working group or the council wants to bring forward in due course. Mm. 
uh, and they would be considered, you know, as, as a fresh planning proposal in the light of um, you know, the local plan, the neighbourhood plan and any other relevant considerations. Yeah, that's 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 just what I wanted to know. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that's that's yeah. great. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you very much, everyone, for that. Um, Nick, do you want to come back one more time or is it a, an old hand? Uh, y- yes, yes, please, thank just you. very quickly. And um, to thank Mark for his clarification, which was most helpful. Um, the other point which must be remembered is that there have been two temporary ap- applica- planning applications on the site for those attractions on the Queen's Drive space. And, of course, we can't have any more temporary planning applications. We must go to a permanent uh, planning application. And that was the main advice, uh, well, one of the main pieces of advice anyway, from um, Ed Freeman. And so that's how we're uh, progressing to make sure that um, the the planning rules are um, uh, obeyed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, So my screen isn't doing very well on, on hands at the moment. So sorry, Mark, to have missed you. I think I might have missed Tim Child as well, but Tim, are, are you are you happy that what you might have said has already been covered? Yeah, thanks, Joe. It's been covered already. Thank you. Okay, thank. And sorry for not. So I, I can only see a certain number of faces tonight, unfortunately. Um, uh, right. In which case, then, um, members, do we wish to make any particular recommendations on this item, or can we agree to move this forward without specific recommendations? I think we're agreed on that, aren't we? But let's take a vote on that anyway, Debbie. Please. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, members of the Cabinet, please, if you could indicate with a green cross if you agree. Oh, sorry, green tick. I need another coffee. Now, uh, if you agree, red cross if you're against or raise your electronic hand if you're abstaining. Sorry, just can I be clear? You're, no specific recommendation. You're happy that this is going to be progressed as, as, a, as a course by officers. Was that, was that what you were saying, Leader? Uh, yes. Well, the minute that we've been asked to decide on, uh, Forgive me, I'm just going back to the actual page. Uh, so it says the recommendation to Cabinet is that in order to provide certainty moving forward, permanent planning consent for temporary uses on the Queen Drive site be sought as soon as possible. So that's that's what we're agreeing to. Tonight. So you do want to more recommendation to that effect? Uh, yes, we want to endorse that no. recommendation. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry that wasn't clear. Thank you. Okay, Chair, so I have eight votes for, no votes against, and no abstentions. So that's okay. carried. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. And right, so we now go on to agenda item 11, the minutes of the LED monitoring forum of the 14th of September 2021. There is one minute that has a recommendation to Cabinet on agenda page 28. It is minute 75 the Strategic Outcomes Planning Guidance, known as SOPG, Diagnostic Final Report. And the question is, do members wish to make any particular recommendation on this item, or can we agree to move this forward without specific recommendations? And I'm just double checking there back with, um, so the recommendation is that the Strategic Outcomes Planning Guidance Diagnostic Report be approved, And the reason for the recommendation is to enable the council to move in line with Sport England guidance and begin the work for the production of a leisure strategy in this financial year. So may I ask for anybody speaking from outside of Cabinet, please, to blip their hand in some way. I can't see anybody. Shout if I'm missing you. Um, I'll come back into Cabinet then, please, with Councillor Jack Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's self-explanatory, but I think it's absolutely essential that we do move move to this next step because a leisure strategy, in my opinion, is absolutely essential for our district. Um, We're a very uh, diverse area and uh, we need to make sure as well that we're providing going into the future that the right sort of facilities are in the right places to to meet the... uh, the uh, desires and uh, needs of our, of our residents. So I actually endorse this recommendation that we need to move to that next step as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Halfway through that, I gave you a thumbs up, Councillor Rowland, that was nothing to do with me whatsoever, just in case anybody was thinking I was trying to encourage you. <laughs> uh, Councillor Nick Hookway, please. Yes, just to really um, 
uh, uh, carry on for where uh, Councillor Rowan and Gary uh, started. Um, it's a very important report. Uh, it has impacts upon uh, the whole district, no matter which ward uh, you are, and uh, it will, I think, be a very useful document in giving some clarity and allowing a leisure strategy to be produced. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Hookway, for that. Um, and I know that, uh, well, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the committees, all of the committees tonight, for their work in bringing these things forward. Um, and the LED monitoring forum has been uh, doing a huge job of work. And may I recommend for any members who haven't yet read the diagnostic report, please do. It's very important for us to understand it. Um, this is this is you know, a big a big ticket item for us, so we do need to understand it. So, cabinet, um, are we therefore happy to note? Um, I'm just looking about. So, where are we? This will be a recommendation to approve. It is recommendation to approve. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Okay, so uh, approval, uh, yes or no, please, Debbie, please. So members of the cabinet, if you could please use your green tick if you're in support, red cross if you're against, or electronic hand to abstain. And chair, I have nine votes in support. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now go to agenda item 12, the minutes of the Housing Review Board held on the 16th of se September 2021. Uh, and there's quite a raft of recommendations here. Uh, so, on the basis that they they seem uncontentious, um, cabinet and members, I hope you've read them all already. But let me come. I, I don't plan to read them all out un, unless there's a need. Uh, can I see any members outside of cabinet who would like to pass? Any comments or ask any questions on this? Um, uh, no. So, Cabinet, I think for the record and for members of public watching, I do need to read these out, I'm afraid. Uh, so, um, the Housing Review Board on 16th of September recommended to us uh, that the tenant representative, Peter Sullivan, be appointed vice chair for the ensuing year and that we agree that, um, or that we recommend that to be agreed. Uh, minute eight was that the housing strategy be adopted and is passed for approval. Minute nine, that the policies are formally adopted by the council, or the, the, the policies formally adopted by council passed for approval. Uh, 11, that cabinet and council approval be sought for additional budget to resource new posts for the delivery of compliance and cyclical service work streams to ensure that the council's housing stock remains safe and compliant so that tenants can feel safe in their homes. Minute 12, this is the penultimate one, that delegated authority is granted with the strategic lead for housing, health and environment in conjunction with the housing service lead and the strategic lead for governance and licensing and the strategic lead for finance to agree to proceed with the relevant stages of the procurement process and agree to granting the contract the contractor identified in the process to deliver the three-star gas servicing contract. That was obviously about the procurement of the gas servicing and services contract. And finally, minute 13, uh, to do the Housing Revenue Account and Housing Capital Finance Report, that the Housing Revenue Account and Housing Capital Finance Report is passed for approval. Um, so... If we take those on block, please, uh, can we vote to uh, recommend all of those for approval by uh, the officer concerned? Debbie. Some of them will have to go to council, Chair, but you, you, you can leave that and council. Recommend, yeah. them all for, recommend them all for approval one way or the other. Uh, and, Chair, yeah. Thank you. Chair, I have Meg, um, Councillor Megan Armstrong would like to speak. Oh, I'm terribly okay, sorry. Perfect. Megan, I'm so sorry. I just, it's I'm all, not, yes, there we go. I can it's see all right. It. I was just basically going to say what you said, Chair. Oh, okay. <laughs> we take them on block. So, yeah, that's oh, all okay. I wanted to say. Are you, yeah, but there's nothing contentious that I can see in there. I was no. at the HRB, so, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, Megan. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, you're, you're at the top of my screen where I can, well, if it's any comfort, I can only see you from the glasses down. So I can't see how yeah, no, yes, no, no yeah. it's not your fault, it's my screen. I, Thank I can you. never see my tick either because it's at the top left hand corner. No, so, well, you know. Yeah. Right. So we were a mid-vote, <laughs> weren't we? So green ticks, you were saying? 
Okay, so members of the cabinet, if you can, please use your green ticks if you are in support of those recommendations. Red cross if you're against, or raise your electronic hand if you're abstaining. And Chair, I have nine votes in support, so that is a unanimously carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. So agenda item 13, the minutes of the housing task and finish form, 9th of September 2021. There's one minute with a recommendation to Cabinet on agenda page 42, uh, and that is minute 29. I'm just going to go to it for the proper wording. Uh, so it's recommended by the Housing Task and Finish Forum that the Housing TAF recommend to Cabinet and Council the recommendations set out in Section 4 of the report with the following addendums. One identify EDDC or market sites or existing developer-led sites. Two, develop agreements with developers for them to develop and make profit with EDDC having a portion of market and or affordable social houses to reflect the council's contribution to the development. This will enable us to identify skills, models and opportunities. Three, concurrent with one, to identify communities that need support to develop a community-led housing scheme by offering technical and financial support. And four, in the meantime, develop flexible models to get proof of concept. So those are what we're being asked to do, and they very much flow into the next agenda item 14, a proposal from the Affordable Social Housing Task Force. Um, so can I ask, please, if anybody from outside of Cabinet would like to speak on that, please do. If not, uh, Cabinet, and if nobody on Cabinet wishes to speak on that, then... Henry, I will uh, seek a vote uh, supporting those recommendations. Um, and in as much as some of them concern council, obviously some will go on to council as well. Debbie, please. Thank you, Chair. So members of the cabinet, please, if you could please use your green ticks if you are in support, red cross if you're against, or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. And Chair, I have eight votes in support no votes against and no abstentions so that is carried thank you right that's fantastic thank you very much um thank you everybody uh so for agenda item 18 which is a proposal for an affordable social housing task force um we'll get a report in a second from john golding uh but we've received a statement from paul smith of cranbrook in relation to this uh, and Debbie, it'd be very kind if you could read that out, please. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Chair. So, as previously stated, this is from Paul Smith of Cranbrook, and his statement reads as follows. With the looming prospect of a further two-year delay in the provision of urgently needed social and affordable housing for local people, I want to make representations to Cabinet on behalf of those who live daily with the consequences of the Council's decisions. A recent FOI request has revealed that as of July 2021, in excess of 5,000 family units were registered at Devon Home Choice awaiting housing provision. Since April 2017, EDDC has failed to build or purchase any social homes and none are planned for the year 2021-22. In December 2020, following representations by Councillor Jack Rowland before full Cabinet, an acknowledgement was made that the East Devon Homes Company Limited, created in 2017, populated by a board of four senior council officers and overseen by a housing TAF, had been unfit for purpose. With funding apparently still available, a new five-year action plan was proposed, but inexplicably on the 8th of June 2021, the company was dissolved. Not a single dwelling was built or purchased during its time of operation. Lessons which might be learned in respect of the running of this enterprise will be hampered by the absence of any documentary records covering the business and financial activities of the company. 
Cabinet too appear to have been slow to grasp the gravity of the housing shortage situation, despite being advised of rising housing costs and rents and the growing shortage of affordable and social homes and the growth of second homes in the district. The Local Housing Needs Assessment 2020-2040 report, prepared by consultants ORS, provides with detailed clarity current and future demographic housing needs. Social and affordable housing are identified as a priority. Considerable focus has been directed towards West End housing development to enable the council to meet district obligations. Whilst initially created to meet localised housing needs, Cranbrook has been a victim of its own attractiveness and is now populated by 40% of residents from outside the area and localised need remains increasingly unaddressed due to availability and affordability issues. The number of second homes, private rental properties, Airbnbs and holiday lets are unknown. Also in what appears to be a perverse move, a deed of variation signed by EDDC and the developers on the 17th of October 2009 removed the requirement for future provision of affordable homes by design as per the original Section 106 agreement. Pending development of a cohesive affordable stroke social housing strategy, I would ask that Cabinet act with urgency to enact legislative measures which would immediately impact upon the pressures indicated in respect of both existing and new housing provision. And additionally, ensure that any task force is subject to measurable timescales of progress and open to scrutiny, transparency and accountability. So that's a statement from Paul Smith of Cranbrook. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for reading that, Debbie, and, and thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, and I think uh, I'm sure other cabinet members will wish to comment. And, and I think the rest of uh, I hope that the rest of today's uh, report and discussion will appeal directly to you. Um, so you cover a number of issues there. Um, the housing company um, is, you know, I have to say this because it's true, it was a legacy matter, it came on, it didn't seem to be getting anywhere, um, and some very sensible discussions were had that it is unlikely that it would. Um, I hope, I, I, and there's no reason why it would do, but I have been shouting from the rooftops uh, for since May last year, but particularly this year, that this council, this administration's number one priority above all others is to address this housing crisis. Now, you may note that South Ham's district council only four weeks ago, I think it was, which is a which is a conservative council, actually formally voted to declare a housing crisis. Um, their problems are very much concerned with second homes, and we have that problem too. Um, and they have exactly the problems that we have, which is you know across the country in many ways. If you, uh, for all sorts of you know family personal reasons, I can tell you I, I've made a personal investigation into what is available in the housing market for letting at the moment and east in east devon uh the answer is more or less nothing more or less nothing and it's what there is is not at a market rate that uh, many people can afford um because of that we have urgently brought forward today's report so i so i hope i hope that acts as some encouragement for Mr Smith uh, but th I thank him for his contribution um, and um, I hope I hope the answers we come through with today may reassure him that this administration is acting. Um, so that said um, and having given him time to warm up uh, can I come to the report then for tonight from Mr John Golding who is our strategic lead for housing health and environment. Over to you please John. Thank you, Chair. So, so this report attempts to translate the affordable housing TAFs recommendations that you've just uh, discussed into a plan to increase the amount of social and affordable housing 
delivered in the district. The central idea is to create a small dedicated team or task force to provide the capacity and resources to deliver on this ambition. We've seen from the research and the investigations that the TAF have conducted that successful housing delivery models are based on a concept of a well-resourced team of people with housing development skills and a single focus brief. The foundation for this um, council ambition is based on housing needs evidence. We are seeing sustained and exceptionally high levels of homelessness in the district, combined with the growth in the numbers on our housing register and limited opportunities due to a small private rented sector, as just mentioned, the competition from second homes, holiday homes, holiday lets, all of this is leading to greater pressure on the limited stock of social and affordable housing. So, so I'd argue the policy refresh is much needed with the supply and demand for housing out of alignment in the district. Uh, and as the leader mentioned, this is a national problem that most housing authorities are grappling with. The, the background section of the report summarises the context of the TAF's work and some of the learning and recommendations that we've uh, found through the, the work of the TAF. It is worth noting that with limited resources working with partner housing associations, uh, community land trusts and our own contributions, we've consistently achieved between two to 300 new affordable homes per annum. I would suggest no small feat, but insufficient to keep pace with, with current demand. The suggested stronger market intervention is very much within our remit as a local housing authority and indeed as a registered provider ourselves. The TAF has discovered that the criteria needed for success is a properly resourced team, a recognition that development is often expensive, it entails risks, and that a pipeline of projects takes a while to establish and sustained investment and focus is required. In other words, there's no simple, cheap or quick fix to this. Rather than adopt a single delivery method to achieve the increased output we're seeking, we've recognised through the work of the TAF that there are a variety of delivery options that will likely produce the best results for the district. And this will include things like continuing to work with our housing association partners, continuing to support community land trust, but also seeking opportunities ourselves through uh, the planning process and intervening in the market, acquiring land, looking at our own sites that have got development potential. The second part of the report attempts to take the ambition and learning forward into a, a meaningful proposal. So a task force or project team approach is advocated in this report, creating a small team of people with the development and property skills and the freedom to uh, and resources to perform acquisition and construction uh, deals, manage projects and help enable others to do the same. So our housing association partners again. The team can then ensure that a finished product is managed by a social or affordable housing provider, be that ourselves or, or a housing association partner. I've captured some of the skills required, that I think are required in, in the diagram in, in the report, it needs fleshing out a little bit. Um, and I think it's also recognised in the report that a certain amount of patience is required as we're planning an intervention in what is a mature and a competitive housing market. We can draw some of the lessons from our housing company experience where we didn't resource the team with staff and we had a business model that um, from inception suggested that we would be uh, making a, a, a small surplus. And as we've seen from uh, talking to other um, exemplars in, in the area through the TAF, that's probably an unrealistic expectation in delivering affordable and social housing. So, so Chair, if the, if the approach 
it, uh, advocated in the report is supported. The next steps will be us for us to work up job descriptions, get jobs evaluated and graded, recruit, induct, and set the team loose on the, the housing market. I've, I've made a best guess at the revenue implications as the jobs will be subject to job evaluation and grading. Uh, and there would also be inevitably a challenge around recruitment as our experience suggests at the moment um, that recruiting these types of jobs is quite difficult. I would suggest we must try and we'll address the issues if, if they prove to be as difficult as we might anticipate. Chair, a really exciting um, proposal on the table here and one that can make a real difference to our residents' uh, lives. And happy to answer any questions or clarification. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, and I echo that. I think this is extremely exciting. Um, uh, I won't take the words out of anybody else's mouth. I'll, I'll come back at the end if I may. So just having a look then for speakers from outside of Cabinet. Uh, Councillor Steve Gazard, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And can I thank John for an excellent report and Mr. Smith for raising the points that he did and your introduction um, that you gave, uh, Chair Stroke Leader. Um, it is imperative that um, we try and do something because you're absolutely right. There is a crisis in housing. Um, there's not a day goes by that uh, as a councillor do I have people contacting me saying, you know, I'm at my wit's end, I'm pulling my hair out. I see somewhere advertised by private landlords and by the time the morning comes and I pick the phone up, it's gone. Um, and that's happening every day in Exmouth and landlords can charge what they're like at the moment. So it makes the problem even worse. Um, but I, I just hope, and I, I hear what John said, but that it is going to be um, something that is going to be um, put into place and will be working sooner than rather than later, because obviously the longer it goes on, the more people are going to struggle to find um, affordable housing. And uh, it's just something that is obviously dear to my heart because um, Exmouth being one of the big, the biggest town in Exmouth, we do have a real problem in Exmouth and that's probably the same across the whole district. Um, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of people that are desperate for affordable social housing. So I hope that Cabinet will endorse the recommendation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Gazard. Um, so coming next to, I think I'm coming back into Cabinet now. Um, uh, Councillor Dan Ledger then, please. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Chair, with your indulgence, can I just... Um, tackle some of the points that were raised in that statement at the start. The, there are a few things that were slightly misleading, the, saying that East Devon hasn't um, delivered uh, any affordable social homes in, in the past five years. It's, that's not technically true. East Devon haven't developed any homes, but our model at the moment is purely acquisitions. Um, it's, it's something that obviously this report is looking to change. Each year, um, East Devon, through either our acquisitions, work with our registered providers and through the planning process, um, actually delivers over 300 affordable social houses to the East Devon market each year. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up. I think the key point now is that we are moving away from acquisitions and moving towards actually developing our own homes. Originally, and it was read out in the statement, that um, it was my motion that, that brought forward this TAF. And um, during the, the work with the TAF, we did realise that the delivery model of the housing company wasn't fit for perfect purpose. And this is the reason that we, we see this report in front of us today. I think the key thing now is to, for us to, to stop talking about it and start doing it. We understand that there's a crisis. We know that there is, um, and we need to start delivering for the people of East Devon. And hopefully, this is and this report 
is, is the start of actually achieving that. So this is our stake in the ground and we really do need to start moving forward. So I fully welcome it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Dan Ledger. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really proud to be part of this administration that is actually grasping the nettle on this subject. Um, uh, the report from John Golding hits the nail on the head when he talks about the resource that's needed because historically that's been uh, a missing piece of the jigsaw to make real progress on this subject. Um, and we really do need this dedicated um, uh, number of people to, to really focus in on this and look to see what can be achieved. I would ask as well, um, John mentioned about uh, writing job descriptions and get them evaluated. Um, I would hope perhaps we might not be, have to start from a blank piece of paper. We might be able to take uh, information from perhaps other adjoining councils that perhaps already have this type of uh, people in post where we could uh, use, use that as a, as a template to actually help on this and uh, speed up that process as well. Um, but as I said, I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, administration that is grasping the nettle on this because without a doubt, we all recognise that the number of people that need truly affordable, rentable uh, properties is increasing. Um, for a number of reasons and there's so many factors lately that are contributing to that uh, not least as well the embargo being lifted on people in private accommodation being um, given given notice to leave um, that embargo is, is finished so that's going to add to the numbers as well um, with furlough finishing we don't quite know as well what the impact of that might be on people's jobs and their incomes um, so I can only see in the short term the actual issue surrounding this actually worsening before we can actually provide what's desperately needed. So I heartily endorse the recommendation in this report. Thank you very much, Councillor Rowland. Um, and uh, I'm going to come back outside of Cabinet now to our Chair of Planning, uh, Councillor Eileen Rack, please. Thank, thank you, Leader. Um, it's, it's something that I've been raising for many years, and it's about the downsizing from council accommodation and the financial incentive that is offered. I don't know what it is now. Uh, at one time, it was about £650. Well, it would cost a damn sight more than that to, to move house. Um, and where you have, say, one person or a couple in three-bedroom council property... Uh, I think the incentive needs to be far higher, far greater than than a thousand pounds, um, and it would relieve the, to a small degree, the pressure on the um, housing needs department. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that I believe we're we're facing an extremely harsh winter, soaring fuel costs, the cut in universal credit. Um, it means that some people, some tenants of private landlords who have all inclusive rents where their fuel costs um, are all in, uh, those rents will inevitably rise. There's been an increase already announced today and a further increase of another 17 percent on, on fuel. So uh, far from it being a better Christmas than last year, as, as the Prime Minister has said, I believe it's going to be a pretty grim Christmas and we're going to see an increase in homelessness and people on the streets. Um, so what I'm asking, uh, I'd like to ask John through you, um, what is the financial incentive for downsizing now, John? Um, is it vastly different? I think the last I heard it was about £1,100, something like that. But it's going to cost yeah, a lot more than that to move house. And if it can free up a home for a family um, in, in, you know, just offering a bit more, surely it's worth doing. John, would you, that, um, well, thank you, Councillor Rake. 
got a detailed question. Do, do you want to improvise or would you rather give a written answer to Councillor Rag? Uh, up to you. A uh, bit of both, if I may, Chair. I haven't got okay. the figures to, to hand. Okay. I know they're on our, our website. And, and it has been quite a few years since we last reviewed the, the downsizing policy. So um, perhaps it's due a review and we could do that through the, the Housing Review Board. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rag. I'm sure um, John will give you the other answers in detail. Thank you, John. Thank Enough. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor John Loudon, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank John for his report uh, and for the speed at which uh, he's turned this around. And, and thanks also to the Chief Executive for his input behind the scenes as well. Um, I think if we look at, if we refer back to the previous item on the agenda, the housing TAF recommendations that we've just endorsed, and if we then ally those to this report, then between them, I think they set a very important framework for progressing greater development of social and affordable uh, homes in the district. And, you know, everybody has said, and it is true, they are absolutely uh, desperately needed. Uh, I think uh, I think it's very clear to everybody that uh, housing is now our number one priority for this administration. It's it's there front and centre in, in the council plan, as we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, if we look at the uh, financial implications in 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 the report, then it's talks there about how we're being able to fund this, and we do have a windfall there that uh, we can use and we are using uh, for this priority uh, and uh, there has been a great deal of debate uh, in cabinet um, uh, uh, privately in cabinet about what we could use that money for and there's, there's plenty of things we could have used uh, the half million for but we have determined that we wish to put the vast bulk of the windfall into supporting this drive to 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 get social and affordable housing uh, up and running. And I think finally, before I uh, say I endorse the recommendations, what I would say is that if you think about the phrase levelling up that uh, is banded around uh, this country at the moment, it seems to mean all things to all people. But what I would say is I think through this, through these actions, we are absolutely levelling up for East Devon. Thank you very much, Councillor Loudon. Absolutely. I'm very glad that you uh, pointed to uh, the financial aspects of this as well. Um, we're very grateful to our officers that they brought it forward to us uh, a little while ago that um, just looking at the uh, financial report here, which is, of course, gone missing uh, i've got it i've got it i'll be there um, at the end of the report chair it is yes i'm scrolling down as fast as my clockwork uh, laptop can do it um <clears throat> i'd headline this uh, council agrees to put half a million pounds into investing in uh housing in the area that's what this is this is uh 250,000 for two years um, and it's come because that money has become available uh, because of the uh, a budget underspend in 2021-2022 um, which will be carried forward to ensure a full two-year period of operation funded for this and the, the only thing I want to urge personally please is to echo what Councillor Gazard said despite the fact it's a competitive employment market and we know that i really hope and i'd like to send you know put this on the job application pack john if you feel it's any help you know the leader of east devon district council says please come and work with us on this this is a magnificent opportunity to make a real social difference a real social good and i hope there are enough people working in planning still in the united kingdom who who will be attracted to that, I hope so. Um, so coming to Councillor Marianne Rickson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this may not be a 
a question that John can answer straight off the cuff. But I think another problem which is, exacerbates the housing situation is the right to buy. And I just wondered how much is lost in terms of right to buy uh, on average per annum, because this is also losing housing to our, our general housing stock. John, are you happy to take that one? Yeah, yeah for, um, I might, through you, Chair. Um, I'm sure the portfolio holder will wish to comment on this because we have lobbied quite hard for the uh, ending of the right to buy. It does seem to make a nonsense of um, trying to provide more affordable housing when you're losing them as fast as you're um, uh, gaining them. In our case, we lose something like 30 uh, right to buy properties a year sold because uh, tenants have got statutory right to, to exercise that that right to buy and we're acquiring uh, something just just short of that uh, in terms of using our own uh, resources so it, it is a, um, a hemorrhaging if you like of, of of social housing and it's something that we are uh, lobbying to um, encourage the government to uh, stop um, that that right that tenants have can I come back, um, Chair? Yes, please do, Marianne, yeah. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more effective if we lobbied jointly with all the other um, districts who are facing the same situation in Devon? OK, I'll tell you what, I know that, I happen to know that the next speaker, yes, <laughs> Councillor Armstrong, uh, is, is a mastermind special subject on this. So, Megan, can I come to you now then, please? I wouldn't call me. I wouldn't call myself a, a mastermind, but uh, <laughs> I have been working a lot on it. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for your uh, great comment. Um, yeah. So, so just, just I was going to mention one or two other things that people have said as well, which I generally agree with that, uh, that all my colleagues have said earlier about this debate, and it and it is a good report from John, and I fully support it. Um, about the right to buy, um, I've been having discussions with with our uh, housing service lead uh, in the last few months, really, uh, with one of the MPs uh, who then referred me to my my counterpart in Mid Devon, uh, who are feeling exactly the same as as we do. Uh, and so we've talked about it. And the idea is, which I've not mentioned to, to anybody really yet, um, because I just want to make sure we've got everything right first, is to actually do what you're suggesting and for all the local authorities in the peninsula to get together and to write to the government to lobby the government strongly because that would come out and that could be done through the um uh the leaders i forgot what it's called now john the leaders group. team team devon team devon team devon, team devon, really team devon that's it with the leaders and the so either the leader or the chief executive or both could present a joint letter from all of us to and we've got to get that letter together yet that's something i'm talking to joe about at the moment um to present that, but there are two issues. One is about actually getting rid of the right to buy altogether, which is a seriously uphill struggle um, because the government are not easily gonna give, give in to that, um, however much pressure they get. We'll still keep trying, but what, we want, what we're trying to do is now is just to try and get more funding back from the government uh, for, for each property that, that is sold, that we keep more of that of the money from that rather than giving it back to government. So that's one of the things. And that, that's, that and two or three other things would also go in this letter, the requests, and also the, um, you know, the upgrading of properties. Uh, if we spend a lot of money upgrading properties to, be, to, to have green credentials, then at the moment, they would be up for grabs, if I've got this right, John, uh, for people to, to buy outright. So all the money that we've spent on upgrading properties uh, over and above what we would normally do um, would be going to private hands. So there are a lot of issues 
surrounding the right to buy, not just not just about getting rid of it, which is ideally what I would like to do and what I've always wanted to do for years. Um, but it's about working within the system we've got and trying to make the most of it, basically, trying to get the most back from the government. And the MP we spoke to is in support of that. And the, certainly my counterpart in Mid-Devon is in support of that. And it sounds as if other... Um, other, other districts in the peninsula would also be in support. So we're getting that together, Marianne. So I just want to reassure you that that is, that is being worked on. Um, ju ju just going back to one or two of the other things that were said, um, I, I just want to reassure Jack, I'm sure that, you know, I, I agree with you. I'm certainly not one for reinventing wheels and I'm sure John is, is, is more than uh, able to and he has done in the past I know looked at other local authorities for all kinds of issues and and rather than reinventing wheels he'll use the expertise that they've had and the templates that they've had so I'm pretty certain that John will will be doing that anyway just to reassure Jack and then with, with Councillor Rag um, yes I agree it would be good to, to give a, bit, a bigger incentive to people to downsize, but there's a big assumption there that we do have the smaller properties for people to move into. It's a big assumption, and we don't necessarily have those smaller properties for people to move into. So it's a, it's a, just a bit of a, a catch-22, really, as far as I can see. John may want to comment on that, I don't know, but that's my understanding, that you know we could ask people to move out of bigger properties, but where do we put them? You know, we, we, we don't we don't have a surfeit of, of properties to move people into. Um, and then uh, there was another thing and I can't find what it is now, but I think that's probably enough for now. But just okay. just generally, just generally, I agree, Chair, with 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 everything that people have said. And uh, yeah, thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Megan. And um, so I, I think probably for the time being, just because we've We've deliciously gone off piste a bit, haven't we, on on uh, on right to buy and on, on on downsizing as well. Let's let's um, bring it back into the recommendations if we can. I do have perhaps a ghostly hand from Councillor Ray still, or is that a? No, it's a new hand from a very oh, old hand. Please do then, yeah. Um, Briefly, just, please. Just to say, just <laughs> one thing that I would like this council to grapple with please is second home ownership that's pricing our families our young people right out of the market um, local people and to respond very briefly um, to councillor armstrong's comment um, offering an incentive might actually um, be appealing to somebody who wants to rent in the private sector doesn't have to be council accommodation. Thanks. Thank you very much. So finally, now we've got okay. Councillor Nick. Oh, yeah, Councillor Nick Hookway. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this follows on really from what Councillor Rank has just said. Um, I uh, heard your speech at the beginning, your comment at the beginning about how we are perhaps in a housing crisis. If we are in a housing crisis, we do need to have uh, relevant data. I we do need to know how many second homes there are in the district. And I think also <clears throat> that needs to be broken down so we know the numbers of second homes by ward so that we can see exactly where the problem uh, is, so where people are being literally priced out of the housing market. So I would like uh, at some point for officers to provide that information to Cabinet because I think that is essential if we are going to move towards uh, call, um, calling a housing crisis. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Luke, Councillor Hookway. I think if I can suggest what to capture some of these ideas, um, and that one as well, uh, uh, Nick as well, which others have said, um, can, you, can you contact um, as portfolio holder for this, Councillor uh, Dan Ledger as well? Because this, this will be, this will sit within the strategic planning portfolio as we move forward and so Dan will be leading on, leading on this um, and that is 
Um, I'll, I'll write to members later about the realignment of the portfolios very slightly, but this will now sit under strategic planning uh, with, with council and ledger. Um, that said, and I think enough has probably been said, and you'll all be relieved we're heading to a comfort break. Uh, Debbie, can we take a vote, please, on those recommendations? Yeah, sorry, can I just yeah, clarify? Thanks. I don't think, sorry, Debbie, I don't think recommendation two, I think that's probably a hangover from an earlier draft. I think you only need recommendation one. Let me have a look. Can I recommend a discussion? Simon and I had a discussion about combining it into one recommendation, and I think that was what one turned out to be, and I think two ended up remaining in error. Is this a tautology? Yeah. Well, it's, I'm not sure it is quite, but it's... it's, it's no, 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 no. Anyway, it, I, you don't need to get into semantics, <laughs> but I think you... You don't need, need number two. I'm yeah, happy yeah. to, from the chair, agree to that. So, uh, uh, Cabinet, uh, can we please take a vote on recommendation one under Debbie's guidance? Okay, so members of the Cabinet, thank you, Chair. Members of the Cabinet, if you could please use your green ticks if you're in support, red cross if you're against, or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. And Chair, I have nine votes in favour, favor, sorry, so that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you all officers involved in this, all members involved in this as well. Um, let's get these people, oh, I sound like Boris Johnson, don't I? Let's get Brexit done. Let's get these people hired, please. Please come and work with us. Uh, and on that uh, bracing thought, um, shall we, this meeting won't go on all night, but I think a comfort break at this point, looking at some of your faces, is probably more than overdue. So if we can reassemble, please, at uh, 7, well, let's call it 7.30. You can have a cup of tea as well. So 7.30. Thank you, Debbie. And if I can remind uh, all members to switch off your videos and go to mute. <laughs>
How are we doing, Debbie? Uh, ready when you are, Chair, if you want me to take the slide down. Um, does it look like there are people gathered in the room? I can't. <laughs> they may well be, but they're... Yeah, we've got a few cameras on. Yeah, I think we should make a start, Chair, if you're happy. OK, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much and welcome back, members and members of the public. Uh, we now go to agenda item 15, uh, the Public Health Priority Actions 2019 to 2020 Annual Review. And we have a report here from Helen Wareham, our Public Health Project Officer. Helen, please. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Chair. So I'll start by just commenting that the pandemic last year, one of the few good things that came out of it was that it really focused everybody's minds on how intrinsically health is linked to economy. Um, and it really highlighted the problems of inequalities up and down the country and how much more that impacted on, on the outcomes of the pandemic. So in some ways, reviewing what we did in 2019, 2020 feels almost of historic interest. But I saw it as a really useful benchmark because that was what we were doing before we knew about a pandemic. And I'm hoping that what we do as a result might be influenced by, by our knowledge and our understanding of, um, of, of how important health is. So, so that was, I think, a bit, bit of extra background to the, the report. The, the process for the report is that we have a public health strategy, which covers now up until uh, 2023. And every year we set an implement, implementation plan, which is done by the teams through their service plans. And then every year I look back at what was reported against those uh, service plans to, to do the annual review. So, so that's how we've uh, come to this annual review at the moment. Thank, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. And I, I do commend uh, anybody who hasn't ha yet had an opportunity to uh, read this report to please do read it. Um, it's very wide ranging, very sophisticated, and it, it shows how absolutely everything uh, contrib contributes to public health uh, that, that we do and it's very handy to have that uh, in, in one place as a document so thank you very much for that. Um, can I look please to see if anybody from outside of cabinet would like to speak on that subject? Yes so Councillor Sam Hawkins please. Thank you. Um, I've had a look at the strategic planning document overall and I was pleased to see that Cranbrook's a priority area and then wanted to bring it back to this last review and see what's actually been achieved in Cranbrook. And I was, I was quite surprised to see that we're leaning on the Sport England local delivery pilot programme when that's a function that doesn't really, from what I can see, have much involvement with East Devon. It's very much a Exeter City, City Council project, if anything. Um, I, I'll pick out one of the examples given here around the... Uh, worked with the Cranbrook Town Council to utilise town green space park, run active family events and community run events. Um, as far as I'm aware, that was only dealt with between the town council and the district council. I don't think, sorry, the county council. I don't believe the district council had any involvement and it seems a bit absurd taking um, credit for something just because it happens in the district. It's a bit like the district council taking credit for me making my breakfast this morning because it happened to be within the district. Um, so I just wanted to touch on really what from the public health strategy plan has happened in the priority area of Cranbrook, if anything, in the last 12 months, please. OK, Helen, that's that's a very well made point, as one would expect. And a big question. Uh, do you have any answers you'd like to give now or would you prefer to write to Councillor Hawkins or come back? or Helen thank or John. You know. Thank you, Chair. C can I just point out that the review that we've got in front of us tonight covers the year of 2019-2020. For obvious reasons, I was really busy last year and I'm a bit behind in reporting. So I, I'm actually still working on the report for, for the pandemic year, which 
you know, I think will show how much different work we were doing last year. So the, the way I create the annual reports, the annual reviews is to pull information from the service plans. So if something goes into the service plans review of what that team did, then I, I can report on it. Um, so I, so I'm, I'm rather reliant on, on various services recording what they do. With specifically the re, um, comments on Sport England, I'm not sure which officers are on the, the advisory or steering group meetings, but somebody in the, the meeting tonight might be able to help me. I was fairly sure that maybe Charlie Plowden or Andrew Ennis or John Golding, I, I'm fairly sure that some of our officers are involved in um, in planning sport England activities, but I'd, I'd need somebody else to confirm that. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, Thank John, you. I can see you're kindly coming forward on that. John Golding. Yeah, Chair, I'm involved in the Sport England um, steering group, and um, there are lots of activities that are uh, planned for Cranbrook. Uh, we're involved in trying to ensure that uh, Cranbrook gets its fair share because so much of the program has been uh, up to now fairly exeter centric they've led the program uh, but there are a number of us that are working to try and ensure that um, cranbrook gets its fair share of activities and i'll happily send um, councillor hawkins some of the um, plans that the steering group have for um, for cranbrook going forward Okay, this there may be. I'm hoping to have a meeting myself with Councillor Hawkins and his two colleagues uh, next week to see how things are going uh, at Cranbrook uh, from their point of view with regard to the district. So um, maybe I'm well. I'll I'll take it offline. But maybe if I bring an officer in to look at that point as well, that that will be worth worth absolutely worth doing. Um, so thank you for that question. Councillor Hawkins. Um, Councillor Brewster Sorum, please. Th thank you, Chair. Um, and um, I, I thank Helen, Helen for a, a very positive and enlightening report. Um, I think it's, um, it is particularly enlightening um, as an Exmouth member for certain areas uh, which it touched on in Exmouth. Um, and I think it was very positive to see what's happened at Wild Exmouth, where, where clearly they have made the most use of the funding for the lottery. And also from the community safety point of view, the Safer Street banner, um, which is tackling homelessness, which is an issue very relevant to all of us uh, within the district. So I, I must offer congratulations to Helen on um, taking this initiative and producing such an, uh, an outstanding report, which um, covers lots of areas in the district. And hopefully, as she updates her records, uh, next year's report will be even better uh, because it will focus on COVID and uh, our post-COVID successful recovery, which we all aim for. So thank you for that, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Brewster Sarum. The one man in England even more positive than Boris Johnson, I think. Always good to hear praise like that, and it's well deserved. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Councillor Paul Miller, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. In, in, um, in uh, echoing um, what my colleague are. said beside me, who's um, sadly didn't turn his volume down, which might have caused a bit of feedback there, so I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to add that having having read the um, the strategic plan and, and the review, it really strikes me that you know this review was created. Uh, sorry, this strategy, public health strategy, was created in 2019, prior to the beginning of the pandemic. And I think Helen pointed out there very well. I think, and she's done an excellent job um, during these difficult times. That that you know the pandemic has affected the council in so many ways, but it's also changed I think um, our approach um, the local authorities approaches and priorities when it comes to um, the issue of public health so from reading the report and I, I look at it and I see for example that the um, contribution that public toilets make to the public health of people in our district isn't ever referred to and I just wonder whether this is you know whether we should take the opportunity now to actually think about starting again. I mean, this public health strategy is meant to take us through to 2023, but we are living in a completely different world now, um, arguably, and certainly a lot of things have, have changed. But um, 
so so what I would say is I'd like to, I'd like to see um, us potentially look at rewriting our public health strategy, but based on the fact that we've, we've had a pandemic and I don't know how that would work, but clearly from what Councillor Hawkins said and what I've, what I've noticed, it, it feels like it needs a proper review as soon as possible. Thanks. Okay, if I can just ask John Golding just for some advice on that. Is this something that we review every few years to, to ensure that we're, you know, capturing concern? I mean, I must say, I think, I think the, the lavatories thing, the toilets, as I'm required to call them, um, is it sort of, it is a rather separate issue in my view, but I can absolutely understand it's obviously a matter of public health as well. Uh, but, but John, I mean, how, how often do we sort of, you know, rescope this as a piece of work? Yeah, we, we refresh um, every three or four years. Um, one of the things that we've taken great pride in is that the uh, strategy is very much evidence-based. So Helen does a lot of research in terms of uh, medical and public health evidence. So it's based on, on strong evidence. But also, I think, as Helen's referred to, a lot of the information is cascaded through the service plans. So we ask all the um, service leads to incorporate um, public health, health and wellbeing in their um, in their service plans. And of course they're refreshed uh, annually. So there's clearly some work we need to do in terms of reflecting the experiences and the learnings that come from the uh, pandemic, but we, we can do that subtly I would suggest rather than a complete rewrite of the uh, the strategy because much of the, um, the the priorities and the the underpinning of evidence is still relevant uh, currently. Thank you John and I was just looking at and I quite agree with you I think the way in which Helen has brought this research and data together is fascinating. I, I didn't know for example that we had um, uh, 1,737 live registered food businesses operating in East Devon and 1,628 are glad to say are broadly compliant but personally as a, as a, as a regular eater as we all are by definition I'm very relieved to see the people out there doing doing that work um, and, um, and that's why I think it's such an interesting report because it, it goes into that micro detail but then it also goes into the more nebulous but fascinating work that comes out of Wild Exmouth, Wild East Devon, as, as, as Councillor Desarum referred to as well. You know, it's another type of health altogether, isn't it? Um, so, enough from me. Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks to, to Helen for her, for her report. Um, I know for a fact that apart from her own cost, she doesn't have any direct budget uh, for this area of activity. So a lot of it relies on what's encapsulated in budgets for other areas. And I think we've had two classic examples this evening of recommendations that have been approved that do have a direct impact on, on public health uh, and well-being in terms of what we've agreed in terms of going ahead with a leisure strategy, which would be an important facet in this and also what we've agreed about focusing in on the last subject we discussed before the break in terms of um, affordable and social housing. Um, and I know from personal experience that Helen is very good about keeping in touch with a lot of the voluntary groups that have um, been established during the uh, either before the pandemic or even more so during the pandemic about where she attends to find out what's happening within those voluntary groups and some of the issues that they're facing. So I think the work she does is, is highly important and I look forward to seeing an update in this area of work. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. So uh, we have no body else to speak. So I'm happy to just recommend from the chair that cabinet note the contribution made by our services through activities viewed only which underpin our public health strategic plan, but not before Councillor Megan Armstrong comes in. Sorry, Megan, just seen your hand. 
you're um, you're not on volume. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I, I just wanted to say that Helen has been really uh, very much a part of the poverty uh, working panel and helped to, towards getting us a, strat a strategy agreed. Uh, you know, she 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 does have a lot of input into that has had a lot of input and continues to do so. And I just wanted everybody to recognise the fact that she, she she contributed to the strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, very much. As, 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 does, as does Libby, who is ne next on the list, I think. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, no, no, yeah, this thank is, you. Uh, yeah. You're playing the Jimmy Tarbuck role here, Megan. Yeah, we're introducing the next act. <laughs> kind of stuff, you know. That's my job. Thank you. Uh, no, absolutely, thank you. Um, now, um, okay, so Henry, if we're noting we don't need a vote, do we or do we think we should have a vote? Oh, I, I, would, I would just get people to confirm that they're happy to note uh, with no one with recommendation or no okay. further. Debbie, can you help us note that then, please? Um, yep, Chair, if, uh, if we just run a quick vote then, that members are happy to note that. So members of the Cabinet, if you could use your green tick, please, if you're in support. Red Cross, if you're against. Raise your electronic hand if you're abstaining. And Chair, I have nine votes in favour, so that's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, our next item, therefore, is agenda item. I think it's 15, probably. I'm just whizzing down. It's 16, corporate debt policy. Uh, we have a report from Libby Jarrett, our service lead for revenues, benefits, customer services, and corporate fraud and compliance and just for public understanding here uh, we're being asked uh, the cabinet recommends the approval of the updated uh, corporate debt policy to senior officers uh, so Libby over to you please. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, this report introduces the corporate debt policy, um, which has been updated to reflect changes in legislation. We've had the new breathing space uh, legislation that's come in in May this year uh, to reflect changes in statutory fees, uh, references to other related policies and reflects, um, importantly, the work um, in relation to our poverty strategy, um, especially around building financial resilience, helping to reduce indebtedness and helping to address the root causes of poverty. Um, as the report highlights, the aims of our policy remains the same. We'll continue to take proactive measures in debt prevention, supporting residents who are struggling to pay, and we'll continue to work with our partners, such as Citizens Advice, whilst ensuring we strike in the right balance in, collect, in the collection and recovery of income due to the council in order to deliver council services. As part of updating our policy, we have consulted with citizens advice as we recognise the importance of their feedback. Um, and other than some minor changes that have been reflected in the latest version um, that's on the agenda, um, their, their feedback is that they felt that we've taken a sensible approach to um, the collection and recovery of debts. And that's set out in paragraph 3.1 of the report. Uh, the corporate debt policy provides transparency over the approach we will take in recovering money owed to the council. Um, it's a consistent, we're taking a consistent, proportionate and fair approach um, to the collection of money. Um, and therefore, um, the recommendation um, is uh, for the um, new updated policy um, to be approved. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Libby. Uh, so do we have any questions or comments, please, from outside Cabinet to uh, get the ball rolling? Um, yes, Councillor Bruce de Sarum, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Libby, I think that was a very positive report. And, and I read it and I felt the most important message was the aim to distinguish effectively between debtors who cannot pay and those who will not pay. And I think that's the key message that the council needs to deliver. And I'm also very delighted that you were consulting with Citizens Advice, uh, because clearly lots of people go to Citizens Advice in the first instance when they've got uh, problems with debt. So I think um, as far as I can see, we, we have set ourselves a very positive uh, and very successful report, which hopefully uh, will we'll, we'll give a consistent approach, as you said, Libby. So thank you for that. 
Thank you for that, Councillor de Serum. Uh, I think we're coming back into Cabinet now. Uh, Cabinet, would anybody like to make any comments on that at all? Or if not, uh, it's a clear round there, Libby, it looks like. So we can therefore go to the recommendation, which, as I said, is that Cabinet recommends the approval of this updated corporate debt policy to senior officers. Uh, Debbie, can you take a, a vote on that, that we're approving that, please? Yeah, so assuming that you're proposing that from the Chair, Chair? Uh, I will propose from Thank the Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just check. So, Members of the Cabinet, if you could please use your green tick if you are in support, Red Cross if you're against, or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. And I have... Chair, I have eight votes in support, no votes against and no abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Libby. And thank you for, uh, Bruce, your contribution too. Um, we now go to agenda item 17, the Innovation and Resilience Fund, known as the IRF, uh, an exemption to the standing order for project sponsor services. Uh, and we have a report on this item from Rob Murray, our Economic Development Manager. Over to you, please, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully a straightforward one. The report sets out the action taken by officers to commission specialist project sponsor support. Um, specifically, this is to help East Devon businesses, um, owners and organisations to prepare and complete robust applications to our now live Innovation and Resilience Fund. The support is based on best practice from the previous leader approach in making sure the proposals put forward fully address the relevant policy and scoring criteria. This will mean that we as officers um, can then develop more comprehensive recommendation reports um, and it will help members of our IRF panel uh, to make more informed decisions on which applications to award funds to. We pressed ahead to secure this support to businesses, really to minimise delays in the assessment and decision making process, which might have threatened our ability to fully allocate all of our ARG top up funding of 1.14 million before the government spend deadline of the 31st of March next year, um, less than six months away. The report recommendation is that Cabinet note the contract standing order exemption for the provision of this project sponsor support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Rob, indeed, for that. Uh, can I ask for any speakers from outside Cabinet? Um, Councillor Steve Gazard, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I hope Cabinet will endorse the recommendation tonight because it's extremely vital and important that we uh, distribute the money before it can be taken back. And I would hate that any of the money that the government have given us is going to have to be returned to them. So, yeah, I hope uh, Cabinet will support the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Gassard. Uh, coming back into Cabinet now, um, Portfolio Holder for Finance, Councillor Jack Rowland. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, reassure Councillor Gassard, I'm sure that money will be used um, because uh, if you look at the ARG funds and uh, the success in actually uh, making sure that money was spent by the deadline dates, which managed to secure the extra funding that's come into this, this particular fund. So um, I'd like to thank all the officers and, and um, Rob Murray for, for all the work they've done on this, because it has been pretty extensive. As a member of that IRF panel, I'm really looking forward to uh, looking at some of the applications that we're going to be considering in the near future. Hope that reassures Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Um, are you happy to propose the recommendation that we have there? Thank you for reminding me on that score. Yes, certainly <laughs> will do. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Um, uh, would anybody like to be interested in seconding that from Cabinet, please? Uh, Councillor Rickson, thank you very much indeed. Her reflexes were faster than the rest of you. Well done. Um, <laughs> And, uh, okay, so in which case, Debbie, can we go to a vote on that, please? Sorry again, there's a contract. Can I just check with no further recommendation? So it's to note with no further recommendation. It is, Thank absolutely. Thank you. 
So members of the cabinet, if you could please use your green ticks if you are in support, red cross if you are against, or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. And I have, I have eight votes in support, no votes against, and no abstentions, Chair, so that is carried, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. Um, I can't see on my screen, is, is Councillor Ledger uh, present and visible at the moment? He is, okay. Dan, can I, can I hand the next item over to you, please? I think, which is the Collerton Neighbourhood Plan. Uh, I'm, I've declared an interest, a personal interest, as a Collerton mm -hmm. Parish Councillor. I think it would be appropriate if I didn't chair this, if you're happy to chair it, please. No problem at all, just let me pull up the script. Yes, sorry, I, I might have told you that in advance. So um, I'll, 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 I'll sing something for a while. If you, uh, I, I can probably introduce it um, quite happily by saying that, um, uh, where are we now? That's agenda item 18, isn't it? Um, Got it, I'll so it's absolutely fine. So um, thank you. it's agenda item 18, call it a neighbourhood uh, plan examiner's report. Um, the only thing that I do not have is who we are passing this over to. I can probably deal with it. Um, uh, Thanks, Mark. Dan. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a form of report you've seen many times before when a neighbourhood plan is ready to go out to a referendum. Uh, so if you look at the recommendations on page 96, you'll see that we're recommending the examiner's um, uh, report is endorsed. A referendum version is prepared and um, we will hold a referendum as soon as possible, but also you congratulate the Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group on their hard work and get, getting to this stage. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Really appreciated. So we'll start with Outsider Cabinet and first up is Councillor Helen Parr, please. Thank you. Well, obviously this is... Um, in my ward and I hope that cabinet will approve the recommendations. I am a member of the steering group and they have worked very hard. And you can see in para one four that the examiner did make some recommendations, but they were really helpful in that they were for reasons of clarity and also some updating that needed doing. Anyway, the um, Parish Council have um, accepted the recommendations of the inspector and I hope you will, you will also support and approve the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Parr. Um, does anybody else wish to speak on this item? No, so... There, currently there are three recommendations, so I'll just quickly read those out. The, the first is that members recommend that the examiner's recommendations on the Colleton neighbourhood plan are endorsed. Number two, that members recommend approval of the referendum version of the plan, incorporating the examiner's mo modifications to proceed to referendum, and that a decision notice to that effect be published. And number three, that members congratulate the neighbourhood plan steering group on their hard work and I think that third one's pretty key it's it's a feat for for any any community to to get to this stage it, it's some serious hard work so um very much congratulations to them councillor Rowland do you wish to come in at this point you're on mute thank you councillor Ledger um I just want I didn't know if you'd actually move from the uh, temporary chair or not do your recommendations, but if you haven't, I'm happy to uh, formally make that recommendation. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Rowland. So can I please get a second of that? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Councillor Rickson, thank you very much. So with that, Debbie, can you take us to a vote? Yep, okay, Henry, if you're happy for me to progress. <laughs> Okay, so members of the cabinet, if you could please use your green ticks if you are in support of those recommendations, red cross if you are against, or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. Thank you. And 
Vice Chair and the Chair, I have eight votes for, no votes against and no abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, before the power goes to my head, I'll pass it back to the chair of the meeting. Thank you very much. And I, I declare Councillor Ledger the youngest person to ever chair a meeting of cabinet by many decades, I would I would contend. So um, uh, not too bad. But as you say, don't let it go to your head. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Dan. And thank you, uh, cabinet and members um, and Councillor Park. Um, agenda item 19 is the council plan for 2021 to 2023. And as you know, members and members of the public, this has been going, uh, progressing extremely well through uh, various processes and through overview and scrutiny as well. So we go now over for a report, please, from our Chief Executive, Mark Williams. Over to you, Mark. So um, to put this into context, there are three plans uh, a council should have as an absolute minimum. Uh, a council plan, uh, well, an up-to-date council plan, an up-to-date local plan, and an up-to-date medium-term financial plan. Uh, this is the easy one, the up-to-date council plan. So um, if you could approve this tonight, that would be welcome. And then uh, we can crack on with the uh, local plan uh, and also the medium-term financial plan. Thank you. That was an excellent, succinct report. Thank you, Mark. Um, so can we come now to see if anybody would like outside of Cabinet to speak on that. Um, doesn't seem to be anybody at the moment. So if I can come to the portfolio holder for this area, uh, Councillor John Loudon, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I had thought before uh, the Chief Executive spoke that he and I were getting on so well. Um, having, having now just uh, told you this was the easy plan, um, uh, this, this will really undo all of the... Uh, all the flogging that I've um, been trying to, to, to tell you I, I've been having to do. So uh, anyway, the serious point is thank you to, to, to Mark and Joe uh, uh, and others for getting us to this point. Um, it sets our course, doesn't it, for the next few years. And it's incredibly important for us all that we have this. And uh, I hope when it goes to full council, well, that's assuming that cabinet endorses it, but I hope when it goes to full council, uh, in a short while, that we can get unanimous support for it uh, across uh, all, all our, our members. The next work uh, that has to be done is around communication and the design of the online uh, plan, and that's already started and underway. So uh, I commend it to uh, Cabinet Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Loudon, and thank you too for all of the work you have put into this, as well as Mark and Joe and the team. Um, it was really hard work, it really was. No, I know, I know, I'm sure, yes, you'll make, you'll make Mark pay for that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, okay, so the recommendation is that we, uh, Cabinet, consider this draft of the new Council Plan 2021-2023 agreeing the final text for progression to the design and publication phase. Um, Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to move the recommendation as well. Um, and also thank uh, John Loudon, uh, Joe Amory and the officers that have been involved in this because it has been um, a procedure which has involved the opportunity for everybody across the whole council to, to contribute to this. Um, so I welcome the stage that we've got to and um, I'm happy to move the recommendation as it stands. Thank you very much, Councillor Rowland. Um, oh, Councillor Young. Yeah, I... Um just like to second that and also to thank all the officers um, who contribute a lot of their time to um, formulate um, or, or uh, formulate this plan um, putting in lots of hours of work and a lot of discussion uh, and thank you to all the officers thank you very much councillor Young, um, and i would endorse that again i think what's been particularly skillfully done is to weave in the fabric of the uh, ambitions of the council 
into that as a plan as well. It's very important, isn't it? If you have one part of the equation with aspirations and another part thinking how are we going to do it, you need to put the two together. And I think this is what this is what this has achieved. Although, as Mark quite rightly says, not to not to do down John's noble efforts, but the medium-term financial plan is, is going to be another thing altogether. Councillor Rowland will we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, so, uh, Cabinet, we have a proposer and a seconder. Uh, Debbie, can we go to a vote, please, if Henry allows me to do so, if I haven't messed that up? Is that OK? Yeah. OK, so members of the Cabinet, if you could please use your green ticks if you're in support, red cross if you are against, or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. And Chair, I have eight votes in support, no votes against and no abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, right, for our final agenda item of this evening, agenda item 20 uh, concerns the Seaton Jurassic Centre in Seaton. Uh, I'm very grateful for uh, a very comprehensive report, which has required a huge amount of research and understanding from our service lead for place assets and commercialization, Tim Child. Uh, over to you, please, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. OK, so this is a follow up report to two earlier reports now provides further detail um, with Devon Wildlife Trust having now vacated the building, but also further clarity around next steps and high level options, which we'll be considering moving forward. There'll be a further report to follow once the options have been fully considered and um, recommendation six um, deals with this by way of reference to a further report back to Cabinet in January of next year. Um, in terms of the report itself, um, section two addresses the economic context behind Seaton and the initial strategic investment in the Jurassic Centre by ourselves and partners to help diversify the visitor economy disperse increased footfall and broaden the economic base of the town. Sections three to nine of the report provide further background on the building itself, our interaction with Devon Wildlife Trust, um, interest in the building to date, and also our contractual obligations to the three primary funders, as this ultimately will then inform the viability of the future options. Um, section 10 of the report sets out next steps, and I'll just, I'll just go through a couple of them if that's okay. Um, this includes, amongst other things, continuing discussions with the funders to get greater clarity on their expectations, engagement with stakeholders. Um, these are ward members, funders, volunteers, DWT themselves, and others who've been involved in the centre to date. This engagement, which will be by way of a workshop or workshops, um, is also to tease out the vision for the future of, 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 of Seaton and how the future use of the site can, can contribute to that. Um, for example, should, should the site have closer ties with the wetlands um, and our work on climate change, um, the climate change emergency? Um, we will also be engaging further with those who've already expressed an interest in the building to better understand their propositions and to understand whether they are, they are viable to both the council and indeed to those parties. Um, a further report will then come back to members for an instruct, this will be in January, for an instruction as to which of the three options that I set out within the report are to be pursued. Once we have a decision following the January report as to which option to pursue, then we will formally market it if necessary. Um, and, um, and as appropriate, depending upon the option we, um, the option that members go for. Um, and finally, um, just before I move on to the recommendations, can I, can I just cover off the options themselves that are set out in section 11 of the report? 
um, they are firstly option A. That's to find a new operator who will continue the running of the building as an interpretation centre. Um, so we're saying in whole or in part, and this could could be um, our countryside service with the creation of a Seaton Wetlands Visitor Centre. Um, and there's some detail as to what that proposal would include within section 11.3 of the report. Um, so um, a countryside offer could be a um, could be a short term proposition to test the market um, or indeed a longer term arrangement and also could be of the whole building um, or perhaps just part of the building. Um, there's then an option B set out, which is for a new provider running the building as an interpretation centre, but not linked to the Jurassic theme, and also perhaps more of a general attraction rather than interpretation centre as such. Um, and then the final option, option C. Um, so if the first two options aren't feasible, through um, lack of lack of interest, perhaps from from from, from, from perhaps ourselves, but also uh, more from sort of other operators, um, perhaps lack of vision as well, um, or the cost to the council of needing to remedy the design defects um, and to support a new operator um, are are so prohibitive, then we do need to consider that the final option of commercial disposal. Um, freehold disposal or indeed leasing the site out for a commercial use. So all three options are being considered um, or following tonight's decision will be considered alongside each other and will be developed further and all three of those options will then be brought back to Cabinet in January. If I can now um, just take you back to the recommendations, and I'm afraid there are there are quite a few of very very varying different types. So the first two recommendations are for cabinet to acknowledge firstly that the centre will remain closed until a final decision has been made over over the preferred option for its future use. And whilst the remedial works, which are, are set out within the report, are are, are being fully scoped. Also, the Cabinet acknowledged that the current position sets out, set out within section two, two, sections two to section nine, to section nine of the report um, um, are, um, are acknowledged. Th further, that there are then a number of recommendations. Firstly, um, recommendation three, that arrangements be made to ensure that should the building remain vacant for the summer season of 2022, but opportunities are explored to ensure a cafe type use can trade in part of the building for the summer season as an interim measure. Um, the next recommendation that best efforts are made to negotiate and agree with the three principal funders. Um, uh, the arrangements to protect the council's position against having to repay the principal sums. That's, an, that's a key, key element there. Um, next, but the next steps set out in section 10 are progressed. Then the three options set out within section 11 of the report be considered with a further report back to cabinet in January of next year as per the next steps detailed within the report. And I did say there were a lot of recommendations, so apologies again. The final one being a recommendation to council that a revenue budget of £45,000 be, be, be agreed to meet ongoing holding costs of an empty property for the remainder of this financial year. Um, and I'm happy to take to take any questions that, that, that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Tim. And I, I'd just like to reiterate, I'm uh, very grateful to you for your efforts, uh, for liaising with the members for Seaton and, and with the leadership and the portfolio holders. Uh, you are in the same position as us. This is effectively a, a something you have inherited uh, and, and are dealing with, and thank you for that. And, and that's exactly the same. That is our position as well. Um, so coming to look for anybody who'd wish to contribute from outside of cabinet. Um, 
not at the moment, but uh, Councillor Jack Rowland then, please. Thanks, Chair. I guess as a starting point, uh, perhaps in the um, asking about declarations of interest, I should have uh, said in connection with this agenda item that I'm a ward member in Seaton. So if um, Debbie could recall that, I should have said that right at the very beginning. So I apologise for my oversight on that. I'd like to thank Tim as well for this extensive uh, and in-depth report. Um, I'm sure many members of the public are not aware of some of the uh, issues surrounding this in terms of the funding that came in from, from other quarters and just what the implications are if the building is, is used for other purposes than its uh, intended purpose at the outset. It's, uh, Tim made a very uh, valuable point when he, I think at least three times, mentioned the word viability um, because that's going to be essential going into the future because you've only got to look at the relatively short history of what's happened here to see that that's going to be a, a major consideration in, in how we look at this going into the future and obviously while the building's empty um, we do have to incur these these costs that are mentioned in this report so um I'd like to, uh, with your indulgence, Chair, without hearing what other Cabinet members might wish to say, that um, I'd like to move the recommendations that are in the report. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rowland. Um, I think next we've got Councillor uh, Jeff Young, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it was a great effort uh, to introduce the Jurassic Centre to Seton. And it really saddens me to see that the facility is closed. Um, let's hope we can make something um, out of this now. Uh, and I would also like to thank the Devon Wildlife Trust for their endeavours to make it a success. And it's a shame that it wasn't. Uh, and I would like to um, uh, second the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Uh, Councillor Maria Rickson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would like to, I would have liked to have seconded, but it's obviously been done. So my only comments are that it is alarming that we have come to a situation where we have a building which is only five years old, but has so many defects that potentially it may even have to be demolished. Um, it might be interesting to know who actually signed this project off. And bearing in mind that it's cost an astonishing 4.2 million, I suggest that we should perhaps add another recommendation, which would be that the Seton Jurassic project should be referred to audit and governance for examination so that we understand the full ramifications of this failed project. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Rickson, for that. Uh, can I ask Councillor, uh, just looking to see if there's anybody else there, uh, Councillor Rowland, uh, would you be happy to accept that additional recommendation to uh, have this looked at by audit and governance from, from Councillor Rickson? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, Jack. Occupational hazard, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'm just absorbing uh, Councillor Rickson's further recommendation. Um, I think it would be a worthwhile exercise um, because I don't necessarily blame any, put any blame at Devon Wildlife Trust because I think uh, from day one they did experience much higher energy costs than they were, they were expecting with this building and that's one of the, the issues to do with the, uh, the plant that needs to be examined. Um, so I think it would be a, a worthwhile exercise. So I'm quite happy to, to have that recommendation included as well. Okay, can I ask Councillor Young, would you be happy as seconder of the original uh, to add that as a recommendation? Yes, I, th I think we need to um, learn from, our, from the lessons uh, of the past few years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I've just seen, uh, Henry, I've just seen your yellow hand there, but I'm not sure if that's a random or a... No, it's not. Uh, it was only that uh, normally 
the, the review of a project like that would go to scrutiny rather than to ANG, which is obviously more related to the risk framework than it is specific uh, reviews of projects and learning lessons and so on and so forth. So logically, it would it would normally go to scrutiny. Is what I was going to say. I can I can I can see that. I, th I think I mean my view is that ANG with it. I mean th this is effectively. Um, it's not a blame game. It's a financial matter, isn't it, really? And we, we luckily, we've got a chair. I haven't discussed this with him. I would be, be prepared to accept it. We have a highly skilled forensic accountant as chair of audit and governance. And it does seem to me that in order for this not to become a political football, which it might do at scrutiny, which one wouldn't want at all, we just need to get down to the brass tacks. And those brass tacks may be looking at some of the original uh, you know, contracts or commissioning, we, we need to understand that. And I think if as a cabinet, we're going to agree to move forward like this, then we're, here we go, there's another 45 grand it's gonna cost us today. We do need that properly looked at. And I, I, my view is that ANG has the skill, I would say for that. If that's, and I think that's okay, Henry, isn't it? Well, I'm not busting through the constitution by, by suggesting that ANG is the place. Well, it's not so much that, it's the, it's, the, it's the specific roles of the two committees, isn't it? If you want to get into the nitty-gritty nitty of a contract and that kind of thing, then that would normally sit more more appropriately with uh, with scrutiny. It's not to say ANG doesn't have a role in some of this stuff in, in terms of risk risk management. Um, so uh, I suppose in a sense it can do, but it may well be that ANG look at it and say some of this is going to have to go to scrutiny as more appropriately for them. But um, yeah, if you want to I, 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 I must say I did wonder that I did wonder whether that might end up you know if it starts somewhere it might be something that's a joint effort uh, Mark Williams Mark I see yellow hand please so if um, if the mood of cabinet is that it should um, be referred to auditing governance for consideration I think the way to phrase it would be that um, uh, they assess where it would fit into the audit plan uh, because essentially it wouldn't be right for the committee, which is uh, essentially advised by officers to um, to carry out that piece of work, you would need to have it done uh, independently, presumably by swap. So um, it would fall to be considered in the context of the resources currently allocated through the um, audit work plan. That's incredibly helpful, Mark. Thank you. Uh, and that does seem to be um, ideal, doesn't it? That actually we have an existing contract with swap and this is something they may pick up for us if that's what AMG were minded to recommend as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, just coming back out again quickly then, I see Councillor Steve Gazard has got a hand up. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, as a member of AMG, Chair, I, I would endorse what um, uh, our Chief Executive has said. Thank you, Steve, very much for that. OK, so I think then the idea is to... I'm just looking at uh, Marianne's wording. Well, I haven't got Marianne's wording. Um, I'm basically referring it to ANG, isn't it? Um, that, okay, that this matter be referred to audit and governance in the first instance is, is probably sufficient, isn't it? There's an additional recommendation to that. Okay, have we captured that, uh, Debbie and Henry, as an as a additional recommendation eight? I think so. Yep, so Chair, if I can just clarify then, um, if uh, Councillor Rickson and uh, Councillor, I'm not sure we got a... Oh, a seconder for her seconded. amendment. Uh, um, Cabinet, would anybody like to second? Around the seconder. Yeah, we've got a seconder, but do you want the wording to read that the Seton Jurassic project be referred to audit and governance for examination in the first instance? rather than including the original wording, which included so to understand the ramifications of this failed project. I'm happy with that. Yeah, so just to keep the first, so that the project is referred to the, the Audit and Governance Committee in the first instance for examination. Yeah. Okay, so Chair, would you like to go to a vote on those? You have the recommendations on page 112 of the agenda and that addition from Councillor Rickson. Okay, yes, um, please. Thank you very much. I don't think there are any other speakers, so let's go to a vote, please, and then Debbie Young. Okay, so members of the Cabinet, if you could please use your green ticks if you are in support, your red cross if you are against, 
or raise your electronic hand if you are abstaining. And Chair, I have nine votes in support, so that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again, Tim, for that. And look forward to working with you on this as we, as we move forward to try and get a positive outcome uh, for, for this. Uh, so uh, that now concludes this evening's proceedings. Um, and gloriously, as you all know, the Chair's closing words are basically good night now one doesn't have to say anything else so thank you uh, we are still transmitting live until debbie tells us we're not so bear that in mind thank you for attending thank you for contributions and good night